Thank you, Robin. Cities around the world are experimenting with ways to develop that are more equitable and inclusive. We've shown that at least at a small scale, it's possible to enact some redistributive policies from living wages to free community college to affordable housing. But just as we try to scale up with these policies, we're about to hit a new challenge, displacement related to climate change. This is taking place in multiple forms, extreme heat, flooding, drought, wildfires, and more. Estimates are that 40 million people were displaced by these disasters just last year. The latest World Bank estimates on internal climate migration suggest that by 2050, the numbers will reach 216 million each year due to slow onset climate change impacts from water scarcity, from low crop productivity and sea level rise. There'll also be less livability from heat stress, extreme events and land loss. So Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia and Latin America will be the hardest hit. The estimates are for internal migration only, but many, if not most, will try to move outside their country if border regulations permit. We just don't know which countries will be welcoming them. The Internal Displacement Monitoring Center adds the dimension of conflict to those numbers, pointing out that in addition to the millions displaced by climate, about one third more will be displaced by political conflict. And a lot of that will be related to climate as well. Adding to this are the economic costs. Numerous studies, including this one out of Berkeley and Stanford have established that economic losses that will be suffered primarily in the global south. As a recent New York Times series asked, where will those displaced by climate go? By and large, I would argue, they will go to cities. 70% of the world's population will be in cities by 2050. History has shown that those who are displaced tend to go to cities where there's more economic opportunity and where chances are they have social networks. By and large, they will go to the cities that are cooler. And as this map shows, the places that don't need air conditioning are largely in the global north. This is an enormous challenge for coming decades. By 2050, cities are going to have to learn how to accommodate millions of newcomers. And this is gonna require new thinking about equitable development or how to address inequality and increase opportunity on a very large scale. We already know from Sally Angel's work at NYU um, that urban expansion or sprawl is how most regions are developing. Most of the new residents will move to the periphery of cities, but most opportunity lies at the center of cities, at the region's core. So we're also gonna have to think through what will happen as the core redevelops. It's important to see this in historical perspective. Beginning in the 1950s, we started remaking our cities. And even though there were some successes, it was the failures that have resonated. This is the construction of the Cross Bronx Expressway, which displaced thousands of low-income residents and divided the community. The Digital Scholarship Lab at the University of Richmond estimates that 300,000 families or about a million people were displaced between 1950 and 1966 by urban renewal. A million more were displaced by the construction of interstate highways. Urban renewal and interstate highways are the most prominent examples of displacement. 
But it's important to note that displacement can occur in many different forms. This chart comes from an early study, 1978, of displacement commissioned by HUD in a climate of increasing awareness of the impacts of displacement. What's important to note here is the variety of factors behind displacement, including not just private sector actions like raising the rent, but many different forms of public action, the public sector building public institutions or enforcing building codes. And of course, natural disaster has always played a role in displacement. So everything we do today to remake our cities has to deal with this legacy of urban renewal. We understand now that neighborhoods were traumatized by government actions. Communities still do not trust the public sector. Psychologist Mindy Fullalove has described this in her book on root shock. Fast forward to today, and we are reliving this as we try to do climate mitigation in our cities. Across North America, we're trying measures to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And to do this, we build new parks, we put in new bikeways, we build new transit lines. And communities feel like these new investments are displacing them. We've studied this. Let me talk about our initial research uh, on climate displacement. So we did a review here of about 400 studies on climate change and displacement impacts. So imagine all the standard sources of displacement pressures that low-income communities face. Now add to that new pressures from climate mitigation measures. Before jumping into some numbers, let's think about for a moment what's different about climate displacement. So I'm gonna outline just a few ways that climate displacement brings a new and different set of issues to deal with. One issue is solastalgia, that's place attachment. So communities that are displaced by climate are particularly prone to suffer from this sense of loss because their places are usually gone forever. Policies play a role here. So countries will differ in how they approach the new climate migrants and how they structure their immigration quotas, and then how at the same time they're dealing with climate mitigation in their own countries. In the case of climate displacement, there's a special north, south north dynamic. So unlike previous waves of immigration, we're now talking about a movement that is mostly from developing countries in the global south to advanced industrial nations in the north. We need to consider here also uh, mental health impacts uh, that are particular to, to climate crises. Uh, we're already seeing this uh, in some ways with the pandemic, um, how these crises quickly uh, create mental health crises as well. Their cultural tensions, receiving communities often do battle uh, over cultural issues and conflicts can become quite violent as migrants are forced to integrate. There's also issues of species migration, not just the human species, but all types of species. And we, it may become necessary to, to manage uh, different species to prevent biodiversity loss at the same time as we're dealing with climate uh, migration from humans. And finally, there, there's a set of imaginaries that are really affecting the narratives out in the world about climate displacement. And I'd like the example of zombie fiction because it's one that, an, an image that many are using. Across the arts and humanities, we're seeing a number of different storytelling approaches. And zombie fiction is one of the most terrifying with images of everyone fending for themselves in the middle of a climate crisis. 
So many cities are adapting uh, to climate change. Many are in deep conversations or actually taking actions. So this visual is from a C40 Cities report with McKinsey describing all the actions cities can take from assessing and accounting for risk to developing insurance systems, to issuing green bonds um, and making a series of physical inventions like uh, street trees and flood barriers. Cities are already pursuing a lot of this agenda, but what's missing from this conversation is a discussion of the real impacts on people of taking these measures. So impacts on the existing communities where these uh, interventions are taking place and then impacts on the communities to come because we have to accommodate extensive future growth in our cities at the same time as we're doing this adaptation. We did a study measuring the unintended consequences of climate change mitigation in California. California is investing in many different ways, using cap and trade revenues um, and other bond financing to fund parks, to fund transit, to fund active transportation. We looked at these investments and then we looked at how many households got displaced by them. We compared investment neighborhoods to control neighborhoods. When we looked at this impact, we found that there were slight impacts of transit and parks and active mobility investments, particularly on low and very low income groups. So you can see here our investment communities in the lighter green and the out migration rate among these groups is typically about 1% higher than it is in neighborhoods without these investments. So impacts are actually very slight, slight enough that we could actually mitigate them. You could house the displaced folks from a new park investment or new transit investment by building a mid-size apartment building. We were surprised by this actually. Um, local communities always organize to stop these investments because they fear massive displacement. They're right, there is displacement. There is new churn that happens with these new investments, but there isn't massive displacement. Another study we did was of the impact of fires on displacement. Here we found, and this is the famous case of the campfire in paradise in 2018, which killed 84 people. We found in this study that after fire, people disperse all over the country, but most, about 90%, stay close to home. In this case, most moved to the nearby community of Chico. People move to cities for opportunities and for housing. One analogy people are making about climate migration today is to the great northern migration of Blacks from the South, 6 million in 60 years. Remember though, that we are now talking about hundreds of millions of people, some fraction of which will be able to cross the borders of their countries to go north. Another important point to consider when making this analogy is that at the time of the great migration, we had tremendous job growth in cities. We had manufacturing growth. We had a war machine at work and we had new mechanisms to build and finance housing construction at scale in new subdivisions with VA financing, for example. We no longer have job and housing growth at this scale uh, that will accommodate these newcomers, the new climate migrants. So let's think about how this might play out in two different urban and institutional contexts. Let's think about San Francisco in the United States and Toronto in Canada. Both have affordable housing crises right now, driven in part by the rapid growth of tech jobs. 
both have extensive nonprofit networks to deal with the issues of refugee resettlement and immigrant incorporation, but both have rapidly rising land costs at the core that are driving sharp housing price increases throughout the region. In both areas, immigrants head for the suburbs, but jobs and opportunity are still concentrated downtown. So there will be a pressing need to build more social housing in the core and expand transit networks for accessibility. This is going to be a tremendous challenge for both cities that will require significant intervention from the federal and state governments. So in the end, arguably, this is going to be an issue not just for cities, but for entire countries. And in this particular case, I predict that the politics at the national level will be very challenging in the United States. Canada, in contrast, has declared its commitment to housing millions of new immigrants in the years to come. And it also has a funding system at the provincial and national level that ensures that both healthcare and public schools will be supported as they grow. So in the case of large scale climate migration to these cities, we can expect more division in the United States and possibly more opportunity in Canada. I'd like to conclude by offering some ideas about what we can do at the local level, since so much has to take place at the state and federal level. So here's a tool we produced from our unintended consequences study. We're looking here at a map of out migration rates. More yellow means more people moving out. Um, and we're looking at out migration in relation to climate mitigation investments made in the San Francisco Bay Area. Remember I said that impacts in our study were quite slight, but communities still fight attempts to mitigate climate change. What if they could see for themselves what impacts are likely to be? What if they could help co-create the mitigations? And what if they could help co-create space in their communities to accommodate the newcomers that we are going to have to make room for? We've seen this kind of tool work in communities around the country fighting displacement. You can bring a map to city council, just as this man did in San Jose, um, to show the policymakers that they need to do something. So for more about our work on climate mitigation and displacement, please see our book by MIT Press. Thank you very much. <laughs>